Hi. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Um, I just would like to remind you that every Tuesday we have a Richard Edwards commercial real estate training class. Richard is doing now cold calls. He's there, see? Every Wednesday we have a residential real estate training class. And sometimes I'll be leading the class, I'll be teaching some subjects, but mostly I'll be inviting the experts, like a, our lawyer, uh, attorney, real estate attorney, title uh, lawyer, uh, John, who is actually number one rated in South Florida with his services, with the prices, with the quickest, fastest, and the quality. And he's with us, as well as we have a number one rated in Florida criminal lawyer, Mr. Scott Kotler. So, <laughs> I hope we don't need him as a criminal lawyer, but, you know, your clients may need him, and so we have him here to refer. But anyway, today, it's a John's presentation. He's presenting uh, about SE's residential contract for sale. He will explain to you all these changes, how to feel, how to present, how to offer, how to close a deal, etc. And John is always here. His doors are open. If you have a question, if you need some clarification, you can meet with him, you can call him, you can email him, you can text him. The same with me, your broker, Roman. I'm here to help you with all the questions. If I'm not here, John is not here, deputy broker, Mark is here. He will be helping you. If Mark is not here, Alexandra, my assistant, is here, Aleftina and Nana is here. So, always somebody is here to help you. Every week, Tuesday training, Wednesday training, additional days we have different presentation, and we have this new platform, you know, right? You can go, and if you want to learn about Matrix, just sit down before the bed, look to the video, and video will train you about Matrix. This platform will train you about CMA, about proxy. There is no subject in the real estate in our platform that you have access. Don't train you about this issue and this subject. So everything for you, you to be successful, professional, close, and bring the check to your family here and family at home. So now the floor is yours, John, and John will present the assets contract and help us to understand how to close the deal better. John, my friend. Thank you, Roman. As he mentioned, I'm here in the office there. Uh, so if you have any questions, let me know. Today we're going to talk briefly uh, about a refresher on how to properly fill out an as-is contract. The uh, contracts I have handed out to you, does everyone have one? If you're missing one, there's a couple lecture here. The first page is my background. It just tells you how smart I am, so you can skip that if you need to. And then we're going to go to page two of the handout, which is page one of 12 of the as-is contract. Okay, first we're going to start with line one. When you're filling out this contract for the seller, do not put owner of record. It does not bind the seller, so make sure you fill out this contract to find out the seller's name. You can do that from the property appraiser's website or you can get it from the LSO. Number two, buyer, put your buyer's name. Um, line seven. Line seven, the street address. Sometimes you guys pull it from the MLS. It misses the unit number. So if it's a condo, make sure to include the unit number. Property is located in the county. That's there. So we're going to jump to line 20. If there is property included in the sale, and it's more than just some preliminary items, make sure to put what I have there. See attached inventory list. It's very important to prepare an inventory list, and what you'll do is you can do it yourself, or you can ask the seller's realtor to prepare one. And what's good about that is at the time of closing, when you do the walkthrough, you can go through there and check to make sure everything is still there. Line 23 is any items excluded from the purchase. Let's say they want to keep a chandelier or something, you put that there. Line 26, purchase price. Line 27, a lot of people ask me how much of a deposit should we put down? 1%, 5%, 10% max, 10% is a lot. So if you see here, we have half a mil, 5,000 is decent to start. 
Um, it's best to check the second box that I have checked out to be made within three days of the effective date. That way you don't have to have your client give you a check and if it doesn't go through, you're holding a check and you have to give it back. So put the second check mark and put three days after effective date. Uh, here's our contact information for the escrow. If you don't want to give it to Red Square, you want to give Nana and Alexander the best work to do, you can send it directly to us because at the time of closing, they have to send it to us anyway. If you want to have your offer look strong, it's always good to put an additional deposit, a second deposit. And I recommend you doing it after the inspection period. So in this contract, I put a 15-day inspection period. So you can give the additional deposit after the inspection period because that way you know that the contract is moving forward and the buyer is a serious buyer. There you can put a little bit higher. I put 10,000 there. So it looks like the full deposit is 15,000. That's a pretty strong offer. Um, if there is financing, you check line 38 off. You can put the amount there if you know what the amount is or you can put a percentage. And obviously the balance is on line 41, 42. Okay, line 45, if you want a certain time period for which the seller is to respond, you want to put that there. Let's say you have an offer, you make an offer, you want them to respond within a certain amount of time, put that date there. Three days, five days, usually pretty decent. If you don't put it there, your offer is open until you rescind it, so they can accept it at any time. So let's say you put an offer on one property and you also put an offer on another property and you don't put a date for which they're to respond, you have two offers out there and you can also maybe possibly enter into two contracts. So be careful with that. Closing date on line 52. Put a date there if it's cash. If you know what time you want to close, put a date there. If you're getting a loan, I recommend putting on or before 45 or 60 days from the effective date. Check with Nick on how loans are being processed, but don't put a date if you're getting a loan on this line because you're not sure when the seller will sign. So if you put, let's say January 31, you're thinking you're going to sign today, but the seller doesn't sign for a week or two, you've lost those two weeks. So if you're getting a loan, make sure to put on or before 45 or 60 days from effective date. Okay, that's page one. Let's go to page two. This is something new and as this contract's at the top, line 53 to 57. Because of the new CFPB requirements, which is a closing disclosure form, if the bank is not ready at time of closing, the closing date can be extended 10 days. So if you get information from the lender and the buyer says, I'm not ready to close, this this section here allows for an, uh, an extra 10 days for closing. All right, so just be aware of that. Next, line 74. If there is a tenant in the property, make sure to check this box. This allows the title company to then contact the seller or seller's realtor to find out what the lease is, if there is a lease, and get a copy of that to make sure the buyer is properly prorated the security deposit and any rents for that month. Paragraph 7, line 83, 84. I recommend the second checkbox that I have checked there. This means that the buyer can assign the, the, the contract to either, let's say they want to open up an LLC or they want to open up a trust. This allows them to assign it to that company um, without any liability. So check the second one. Financing, number 8, paragraph 8. Line 88, okay. 89. So what sure. if buyer decides to resign? How usually it works? Do we need to make another contact new one for the name of LLC or is it supposed to be just an extension? Good addendum? question. If you do decide to do an assignment, best to do it by an addendum. Okay. And it's a one-line mm -hmm. addendum, very simple. Buyer and seller agree that the buyer shall be mm -hmm. so and so. Uh, and if, if you guys have any questions as we go along, going kind of quick because we have the presentation after this and I think it's also lunch, so um, let me know. Feel free to raise your hand. Okay, if uh, there is a cash purchase, you're going to check off line 88. If it's a loan, obviously you're going to check off 92. That explains that. Okay, we'll go to page 3. Next page. These are the closing costs. If you represent a buyer, I recommend checking out line 161. 
the Miami-Dade Broward provision. This requires the seller to pay for a lien search and a title search. That's basically the difference between triple I and double I. Double I has the buyer paying for all the searches. Triple I has the seller paying for the lien search and title search, and you'll see that up under paragraph 9 between lines 125 and 143. I also recommend for here to put on line 143, you'll see there the broker processing fee. You put it in there, so at time of closing, the buyer didn't say, hey, I didn't agree to that. You can say, well, actually, it's in the contract. So I recommend including that on line 143. John, what's customary to sell for? Buyer, seller, or it's up to grabs? In Broward and Miami, it's customary for the buyer to pay for title insurance. In Palm Beach, it's customary for the seller. Why that is, I have no idea, but that's just the way it is. Palm Beach wants to be different. Okay, next page, page four. Line 175, special assessments. I get questions about this a lot. In this section, in this paragraph, does it include condominium or homeowners association assessments? Does anyone know? No. No, correct. As you'll see there on line 175.76, at closing, seller shall pay the full amount of liens imposed by a public body. Next line says public body does not include condominium or homeowners associations. We're going to find out more about that in the condominium rider. So a lot of people say, hey, look, well, we checked off B and the seller supposed to pay for it in full. Um, why is the buyer paying for it? Because the common rider actually controls. This is just for public bodies, which means cities. So if there have any special assessments for roads, uh, um, anything like that, lights, this is where the special assessments come up, come to play. But it doesn't apply to associations. So be very careful. If you're thinking you check out B and your seller or buyer is protected, they're not. So we'll get to the special assessments for homeowners association and condos in the riders. Uh, disclosure, so that's the rest for page four. Moving on to page five. The good part about the as is contract is this section here, paragraph 12. The buyer can cancel for whatever reason during the inspection period. It says here, if you leave a blank, it's 15 days. Do not leave this section blank because we don't want anyone changing it later on. So even if it is 15 days, I recommend putting 15 days as I did that. So during these 15 days, you have to hire an inspector. You can recommend an inspector to your buyer. Recommend recommending an inspector to your buyer. Sometimes they don't know. So if you have a good set of inspectors, appraisers, um, I always recommend that to your client because you want to look like a one-stop shop here, so you don't have to go look. Especially if you have a good inspector, it's good to recommend. So during the inspection period, 15 days, they can do the inspection, and if there's anything wrong, let's say the inspection comes back with certain issues, the buyer can cancel for whatever reason. They don't have to give a reason. You just have to give written notice, and you'll see on line 247, you have to deliver written notice of such an election to cancel to the seller prior to the expiration of the inspection period. So if you have 15 days, don't schedule the inspection on the 15th day and try and say on the 16th day that you want to cancel. It will not work. You have to cancel during the inspection period, which is during those 15 days. Now, you can, what I've seen is, as a buyer, you can say to the seller, hey, look, there's some issues here, we're not comfortable, we're either going to cancel or we're going to ask for a contribution from the seller for certain repairs. You can do that. The seller can say no, because they can say, look, it's an as is contract, and the buyer can say, okay, fine, we're canceling. So that's how that kind of negotiation plays out. Sometimes the seller will contribute some money is depending on how bad the inspection report is. So consider negotiating that and speaking to your buyer about those issues. Next, line 257, you are obviously entitled to do a walkthrough inspection the day of or prior to the closing date. This is also highly recommended because you want to make sure there's no damage to the unit and all the items that they said are going to be there were there. Refrigerators, dishwashers, they didn't take any appliances. So make sure to schedule the walkthrough the day of the day before. 
Okay, I mentioned on um, paragraph 12a, the 15-day inspection period is the good part of the as-is contract. The bad part is uh, paragraph C, the buyer is responsible for closing out all open or expired building permits. You'll see on line 269, 270, sellers shall not be required to expend or become obligated to expend any money for these building permits. So it becomes a buyer responsibility, even though it's a permit that should have been opened and closed by the seller, because it's an as-is contract, that responsibility falls on the buyer. However, there is a way around this, and we'll get to that on page 12, where I've added some language that states that the seller is going to be responsible for any open or expired building permit. So I also recommend it. We'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, let's go to page 6. All the way at the bottom, paragraph 15. People say, what happens if the buyer defaults? It's laid out in this section here. The buyer defaults. The seller may elect to recover and retain the deposit. So if the buyer defaults for whatever reason, they don't comply with the contract, they lose their deposit. And then, I mean, it's not that great, but on the last line there, 325, the portion of the deposit, if any, paid by the listing broker upon default, so sometimes the listing brokers in the listing agreements have that if there is a cancellation, the listing broker will get a portion of the deposit before it's given to the seller. You are entitled to half of that. So make sure you contact if there is a default and the seller does retain the deposit, make sure to contact the listing broker and retain your half of the security deposit that they're entitled to. All right. John, yes, sir. in practice, how easy or difficult is it to actually collect on that deposit? Right. So there's two ways of releasing a deposit by court order or agreement between the parties. And that's that cancellation form. So let's say your buyer wants to cancel. You have to fill out that cancellation form. And on that cancellation form, it'll say who gets the deposit. If the buyer doesn't agree to it or seller doesn't agree to it, they have to either go to mediation or they have to go to court. And the prevailing party, whoever wins, gets their attorney's fees paid. So you're talking about a couple thousand dollars, $5,000, depends on the amount. Um, sometimes people negotiate it down, say, okay, look, I'll keep half, you keep half, and let's go our way. So that's also negotiable, um, but there's only two ways, agreement between the parties or court order. In timeline, if they have to go to court all the way, what do you think, 30 days or? Oh, no, no, six months, six months, maybe a year, depending how good their attorneys are, how much they want to fight it, how much their attorneys want to build, so it depends. So yeah, you know I'm an attorney. I would say avoid attorneys, avoid going to court. Um, it just costs fees and it costs aggravation. Um, so try and settle as best you can, if you can. Twenty grand to fight over five. Yeah, yeah, it can get up to there. Sure, sure. Okay, so next. It's not known on the listing uh, agreement. The local agreement. Correct. So, so that's the uh, thing is how do you find out when you're on the other side that the, that the listing agreement it shows that because they didn't, they didn't show it to you and it's not in your contract. Correct. So what you can say if you represent a buyer, before I have my buyer sign this, I want to see a copy of the listing agreement. Oh, sorry, you want that? Ask them for a copy of the listing agreement. So they have to do it before I'm mean, Right, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean. so you're going to say, before I have my buyer agree to release the deposit, I want to see the listing here. Oh, before the sign. Yeah. Okay, so line 329, what happens if the seller defaults? The buyer gets the deposit return. You'll see that on line 331. And the buyer can either go to mediation, which says pursuant to paragraph 16, or the buyer can sue the seller, and it says seek specific performance, which means in legal terms that the buyer can force the seller to sell the property to the buyer. That will take some time, and also you have to hire attorneys. So those are the options if the seller defaults. Speed resolution of paragraph 16, and that's the rest of the page seven. Let's go to page eight. There's another question I get a lot, time. How do you calculate time when you're counting time periods in the contract? Anyone knows? Is it calendar days or is it business days? Business. 
Calendar days, correct. It used to be business, but it's calendar days. Line 418, time. Calendar days shall be used in computing time periods. Now, if the calendar day falls on a Saturday or Sunday or legal holiday, it goes to the next business day. So, when you're counting 15 days inspection or deposits, make sure you count calendar days, which is basically you count every day, including Saturday and Sundays. Unless it falls on the Saturday and Sunday, then it goes to the next business day. Alright. Next, page 9. Bunch of legal stuff, nothing really to concern you there. Page 10, bunch of legal stuff. This is really for the title company. If you want to know. It's good to read it though if you have time and you read the board. Okay, so line, let's start with the addenda, paragraph 19. Page 11 of 12. If it's a condominium, make sure to check off A. Obviously, if it's a homeowners association, make sure to check off B. These are the rest of the addendums. Maybe we'll have a class one day and go through all the addendums. So uh, make sure to check it off and also to attach it. Just because you checked it off, um, don't assume the seller is going to prepare one. So uh, make sure to also attach that to the contract. Uh, paragraph 20, you can put line 567 if you like, and 569 and 570. This will contradict what we talked about where the uh, buyer is responsible for open permits. This requires the seller to still be responsible for the open permits. If there exists any open or needed permits or code violations, then seller shall, at seller's sole expense, close any and all permits and or code violations. This clause supersedes anything to the contrary in the contract. This is very important because sometimes permits can cost a lot of money to do and a lot of time. So you want to protect your buyer since you are doing an as-is contract. This protects your buyer and I recommend using this clause um, when you do as-is contracts. Yes? Huh? A, I'm sorry I came late, so I've, made, I've been addressed already. And the new um, contracts, and the regular ones, it addresses this, but it's not the access contract, the regular Florida bond. So is it better, more advantageous to use the regular bond one or the access contract? Because it does address this thing about permits. Right. In the regular contract, she's asking the difference between the regular contract and the as-is contract. The yeah, as-is yeah. contract requires the buyer to pay for the permits. The regular contract requires the seller to pay for them. Obviously, if you represent a buyer, the regular contract is a little bit better, and actually we can have another course on that, the differences between the two. But there's basically three differences. One is the permits, one is termites, and the other is repairs. So the regular contract requires the buyer to be responsible for those three items. However, the regular contract does not allow the buyer to get out for whatever reason. You know, we had that inspection period where the buyer can get out during the 15 days for whatever reason. During the regular contract, the buyer cannot get out during the inspection period. There's some rules there that the seller has to be able to repair up to a certain amount. So that's the difference between the two. So that's why I recommend this clause, because sometimes sellers will say in an MLS, only as is contracts allowed. So you can do the as is contract, but you can put this clause in to protect your buyer with regards to permits. And usually in condos, you don't have a termite issue. And repairs, we talked about, about negotiating during those 15 days. Thank you, question? Yes. In the as is, there is an inspection, the regular or not. There is an inspection during in the as is, however, you cannot cancel <coughs> for whatever reason. The as regular contract has not. a 15 day inspection period, but if there is something found in the inspection report that requires fixing, the regular contract requires the seller to fix it. Okay. Up to a certain amount, if you leave a blank. That's up to 1.5% of the purchase price. So if you do an inspection, you find something in a regular contract, you give it to the seller and say, hey, seller, here are the issues. You have to fix them. You can't yes, cancel. And you cannot cancel, right. 
during an as-is contract, during those 15 days, you can cancel for whatever reason. And so it does not have to fix the other one. Correct. Exactly. That's the difference. So, if you represent a buyer, I suppose it's better for you as realtors to use a regular contract. Uh, however, you kind of tighten your buyer's ability to get out. But then again, you don't want the buyer to get out anyway. So, uh, but if it is required to use an as-is contract, make sure to put that language in there about the permits. So, John, I have another question. Uh -huh. Going back to this thing, so should you have a work with buyer that has financing involved? Is this going to create a cloud in the title or not? Nope. The seller will have to fix up a portfolio. No, but it says, okay, so the buyer, okay, the seller decides not to place it. Whatever it might be, like a permit. Yeah, or yeah. a permit of violation. So does that mean that it prevents the buyer from buying the property with a mortgage or not? So if I land the seller has to do it. No, but I'm saying that that means that it's the buyer is responsible, and the buyer will have to fix the permit issues. Okay, but can you still get a mortgage? Yes, the, the mortgage is not, uh, uh, won't be affected by a permit, especially if the permit's going to be fixed with foreclosure. But if it's not going to be fixed with foreclosure? It has to be. Because as a title company, we won't insure an open permit issue. Okay. So it has to be resolved by either the buyer or the seller and foreclosure. So it's resolved by a title company, so it doesn't really affect the mortgage. Okay, um, let's go to page 12. Obviously, this is where the signatures are. Line 597, the buyer signs. Don't forget, this is also very important to have the buyer and seller include the date. Because, do we know why that's important? The dates. Anyone have an idea in regard to effective date? The effective date is when the last party signs the contract, and that's what starts the time periods running. So, let's say I sign today, and someone signs tomorrow, the effective date is tomorrow. If I sign today, and someone signs a month later, the effective date is a month later. So, make sure the dates are included. So now let's say I sign, I date it, I give it to Ariel, Ariel takes a couple of days, he signs it, but he makes changes. He changes the purchase price from 500 to 550, and he initials it. Do we have an effective date yet? No. 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 So then I, now it's a counter offer. So we have no contract yet. So I can either agree to his change, and I can initial, and then that becomes the effective date. Or I cross out his 550, I put 525, and I initial it. Do we have an effective date yet? No. No. So then it goes back to Ariel, he decides 525. Okay, I'll initial it. So we want to make sure on that last initial that that initial is dated. Because it could happen a couple of days. This can go back and forth for a couple of days. So make sure to initial and date any changes to the contract. And it's also important to initial all changes to the contract. Let's say he changes the, the, uh, the purchase price, he also changes the closing date. All changes to the contract must be initialed by both parties. And date? Or just the CD? And date, yes, because it's important. If it's done the same day, no. But if it's done any other day after the same day, yes. Normally contracts are supposed to be in front of each other. That's why you can initial, but nowadays everything's done online. So. If I send you a counter offer, I just put my, uh, I scratch off the offer, I put the counter offer, and I put my initials on it. I don't put the date yet, but you would put the date because it'd be the no, final. No, you know, you can. It's good to do it because if, let's say, I initial and date it, we don't know when you initial it. So, I mean, you have, in court, you can go with email trails, but it's best to put the date, just a quick uh, initial and date. Even if mine's just a counter that might not get accepted, yeah, still put the date next to the initial. Right, because then they're going to initial, but then we don't know when you initial, so we don't really have an effect. What happened if, well, I initial, you initial, we come back and forth, and I mean, nobody did put the date, and then there is no date, does it affect, like, legally, then I mean. Right, so what you would do then, if your parties forget to initial, if well, you... Well, forget to initial, forget to, to 
date. The date. So then you can put in a follow-up email. Here's a copy of the contract fully executed and initial. The effective date is today, January 25th. And that will work. And obviously you save that. You can put it in the file. And that will start the date running. All right. And then also don't forget, obviously, to put your contact information on lot 615 and 617. Okay. Now, under line 617, don't forget to write down your percentage for your commission there. Yeah, I've seen that. You can do that. You can do minor risk or dash 3%. Um, that's not a problem. Because sometimes we do negotiate the, um, the percentage. Like the seller wants to pay 2%. We did negotiate. We said, no, we're not going to do it. We want 3%. So they agree on it. So we put here 3%. And the seller's agent gets 2%. So if you do, I mean, you could negotiate it. It works, we did it. So negotiate and write it down there, 3% or whatever percent you get. Right, you'll see sometimes in MLS, 5% commission. Well, that's not your problem. Make sure yeah. you put your 3% and then put 2% for the seller's room. If they were trying to get you at 2.5%, but just say, hey, look, well, my buyer's gonna go somewhere else. So you don't have to agree to a 2.5%. I've seen people put three and two, like Mark said, and then the seller will sign it. So, yeah. um, because one percent and a half million dollar deal is five thousand dollars. Sure, and it's not. You don't ask you money. <laughs> okay, next page is a condo rider. Um, the initials on this page go at the top. Obviously, the initials on the contract go at the bottom. With this condo rider, the initials are at the top, and it's only on this page. Um, if there is a condo approval required, make sure to check off this first box on the paragraph one. What, right of first refusal, you might not know that, so you can leave those blank and allow the seller to fill those out. If you happen to know under paragraph three, the monthly assessment, you can put that in there. If not, leave a blank and the seller is responsible for filling that in. Page two of the condo writer. Here is where the special assessments apply. This is paragraph C, special assessments and prorations. This is for the association special assessments. On line C double I is where you check off buyer is responsible or seller is responsible. This is the one that controls. You know on the contract we saw we saw that section where it said public body assessments. This is the association's assessments. So if you represent a buyer, make sure to check off seller if there are any. And then under paragraph five, this is also important, B, this says that the contract is voidable upon receipt of the condo docs. So what that means is, and you'll see on the next page, this is void, this can void the agreement and does not terminate at closing. So, you can cancel the contract within three days of the receipt of the condo docs. So what does that mean? Let's say you got the condo docs a couple days before closing. This clause says that you can cancel within three days of receipt of the condo docs. So if you represent a seller, make sure to give the condo docs to the buyer so you don't get in trouble with this. If you're the buyer, you want to request the condo docs but if they don't give you the condo docs, you can kind of have that in your back pocket about being able to cancel in case you need it out later on. Uh, but you must request it. So on the next page, under paragraph C, we must check off that first box that you request. If you request it, and it's not given to you, you can cancel at any time during the contract. If you do get it, you can cancel within three days of receipt. So just be mindful of that. Uh, but then also paragraph eight. Well, paragraph seven, if you represent a seller, make sure you check that box off and include the date that you did provide it to them. Paragraph eight, parking space number. It's not the number of parking spaces, it's the parking space number itself. Yeah. If you represent the seller, just make sure to provide the condo docs to the buyer. And once you do that, on the paragraph 7, you're going to include the date that you did that. You see it? Buyer received the documents described in paragraph 5 on so and so date. 
And so as we were saying in paragraph 8, make sure to put the parking space number. Is it A25, B36? Because the title company at time of closing needs to prepare and sign the parking space. And that is a refresher on the as is contract. Any specific questions? Yes. You can let me know. Uh, Otherwise, use this kind of as a guide and when you're filling it out. And uh, don't be afraid to ask. I just want to mention your views in there. Um, on the page one, property description, because we have the issue at sales, make sure you don't copy and paste that from MLS, because sometimes the other realtors, they put the wrong address. So make sure when you put in the property legal description, Go on the tax record and call the place from there, especially when it's a finance deal, so it will cause some delays for you. Because some other way that they might make a mistake there. And, and other things, and the purchase price, paragraph two, okay? And I suggest everybody pick up the deposits right away. Don't wait three days. Because what happened, okay, I know it's the legal department of Brian says, what happened, always when the customers put in the offer with you, and puts a deposit in there, in his mind is this, I'm buying a house. And now you have a deposit there, and it goes. When they don't have a deposit, on the way they're driving, they change their mind, you know? They don't have a deposit, they don't show up. So get the deposit at the same time they put in the contract there. And try to get the maximum of the money, because when you get like a couple thousand dollars on a deal, and they change their mind, they could just walk away, say, I lose three grand. Which that three grand is not gonna cover your commission, the other, Commission. So, but when they have forty thousand dollars, now if they, they cannot walk away with forty thousand dollars, first of all, even if they do, you get the commission by now. The other uh, rate get the commission, and the seller gets the rest of the money. So, go for the maximum deposit, and get the deposit with it when they make an offer. They sit in here, just say hi. We require ten percent deposit. How much money down today? You know, just very easy. Because more deposit you have, more they are locked. But when they don't have a deposit, they get home. Causing calls, while they cost, why are you buying this? That you know, people are negative. And if you have no deposit, they walk away. There's nothing you could do. But get the maximum deposit and the same name in the contract. That's what I recommend, and you will be able to do yourself. And now, one more thing uh, inspection date. Because, first of all, when you have a bigger deposit, and if the uh, seller has three offers for the same price, he's going to go with the stronger deposit. Because you feel safe, no? And for the inspection, I recommend to put seven to 10 days. 15 days is too long. It doesn't take more than two, three days to get the inspection, it's four or five hours. That's what they sell they like, because we put 15 days, they scratch it, they send it back, seven days, you go 10 days, and another like extra two, three days. So those are the things that help you a little bit uh, on, the, on the sales. Besides that, I have a question. Yes. Okay. Let's say you, know, you have a contract put in, uh, buy it for $21,000 deposit. It's a short sale. It's been going on for five, six months. Now we have a closing date, and the uh, buyer wants to back out on the contract, which is two days before the closing. Okay. So now, if, uh, if what happened was, upon approval of the short sale, there is a 30 days you can close, close the deal. That's one point. Uh, so it passed by, let's say, five days after the 30 days. Would they get the buy back? Let's say most because likely the expiration, yes. expiration date, we still have 10 days to go. Correct. That's, there should have been a short sale addendum right into the contract, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything is done already. That's going to set the rules on who gets what. So read that carefully. And if you want me to look over it, I don't know. And another thing is, let's say if uh, they keep deposit, I mean, I'm going to type it, just right? Uh -huh, okay. If they keep deposit, how that deposit goes to like how they split, you know, would the you know would the sales guy will get something from it or you know seller will get some how that twenty one thousand dollar goes splits? Uh, right. So there has to be be seven months, six months work, you know. Right? There yeah. has to be a disbursement authorization form which states who gets what and signed by both parties. You know, we're talking about either court order or signed by the parties. You have to get something in writing, signed by all the parties, and the distribution of the money, who gets what. What's the regular? Rent other exchange, so 50-50, right? 50 gets the owner. Right, 50 to the owner and the 50 to the realtors, and the realtors split that 50-50. And what's in this case, 25? It depends on the listing agreement. The listing agreement between the seller and the seller's realtor. 
So as Miguel was mentioning, you need to get a copy of that to find out exactly what their distribution and what they agreed to when they first. If there's nothing. If there's nothing, right, then you don't have to. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.